This is the fifth week of our Abide series, and today I'll be preaching on the topic of the Word keeps us from evil. I want to jump right into the Word, as a matter of fact. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says this. It says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Lord, help, help us this morning hear and see and understand your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I really hope that this Abide series has really helped you do exactly what the scripture said, which is to allow God to transform you, the way you think, the way you act, the way you react, interact, to line up more of how Christ would do. And that is our hope, is that there would be a transformation and a change that makes us more like Jesus. And one of the primary ways that we do this, if you haven't figured out this whole month, is by abiding in God's word. And you know you're abiding in God's word when you actually start to live it, not just read it, Not just carry the Bible around with you in your phone or in your backpack, which is all good, but you know you're abiding in the Word when you start to live it. You know, the other night, I don't know about you all, but I have some of the best and worst ideas in the middle of the night. Only problem is, in the middle of the night, I always think they're the greatest idea that's ever been thought of in all of history, and I write it down. And sometimes I wake up the next morning, I was like, wow, what the heck was I doing? What was I thinking? But there was one night about a week and a half ago, I was laying in bed, and I was thinking about this word, and I was thinking about, I was preparing that day to preach this word, and so I was starting to formulate some thoughts, so I was marinating in it, and I'm laying in bed, and I'm thinking about it, and my wife, who was pretty much all but, you know, almost all asleep, I laid there, and I said, sweetheart, have you ever noticed that the word live spelled backwards is evil? And she, she you know, was kind of like, ah, okay, okay, whatever. And I'm sitting here like, oh, my gosh, has anyone ever saw this or heard this before? You may have. But for me, it was just an opening. But, and I laughed because I woke up the next morning. I'm not sure if it's deep or profound, but for me, it left a little mark uh, on me. And, and I wrote that down because I wanted to share that because the word, the word keeps us from evil because it shows us how to live the right way. And it transforms us from our backwards living, evil, to more of a kingdom living, which is live right. And that's what this word does. This is how the word keeps us from evil. It transforms and changes us. A good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Chris Johnson in Harrisonburg, Virginia, shared a study with me uh, just this past week. And It's a profound study by the Center for Bible Engagement. They did a research project of about 40,000 plus Christians, um, and they asked them a whole bunch of questions around the engagement with Scripture. And there was a couple of things that I want to share and highlight with you. One, for those who identify as Christian, only 30% of them actually uh, don't read their Bible at all. There's not a regularity to their time in the Word. There's, they, there's not one day a week, no days a week. They don't really read their Bible at all, at all which means 70% of, of self-identifying Christians read the Bible. But this whole study was about different levels of engagement. And so this says here, it said this, that those who engage in the Word once or twice a week have minimal effect on their lives. Those who engage up to three times a week, they begin to to, to see a little something changing. There's there's, there's minimal effect, but something starts to happen. You start to show some life. But they found this. For whatever reason, once that number hits about four times a week of actually engaging in the word, something truly amazing begins to happen. And I want to share some of those stats with you. They, 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 They listed it down as this. Feeling lonely... 31% lower when you engage four times a week in the Word. Anger issues would drop around 32%. Relational issues drop 40% on average. 
alcoholism, 57% lower odds. Sex outside marriage, 68% lower odds. Pornography and engagement in pornography would drop 61% lower odds just by engaging in the word four times a week or more. Gambling, 74% lower odds. And if you're a gambler, you know that 74% is a good percentage. Those are good odds. Spiritually stagnant. Anybody ever felt spiritually stagnant? Try reading your Bible four times a week or more. It's, it's said that it drops around 60%. Now, of course, these are averages, but this shows you what reading the Word and engaging does. The two statistics that I love the most was this. Was when you engage in the Word at least four times a week, the sharing of your faith jumps 200%. Making disciples jumps 230%. Why? Because the word keeps us from evil. And it transforms us by renewing our mind to be more like Christ. Family, anyone watching, find a Bible and start reading it. Sit in it. Get into that word so that word can get into you. So there's three things that I want to highlight. There's so many things I wish I could highlight. But this morning I want to focus on three in, in the realm of the word keeping us from evil. And the first one is this. The word keeps us from evil when we keep the word. The word will keep you from evil when you keep the word. I want to read in John chapter 17. We're going to read through John today in a few, few verses here. And this is Jesus praying to God. So this is Jesus praying out loud in front of his disciples. And we'll pick up in verse 6 where it says, he says this to God. I have revealed your name to the people you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you because I have given them words you gave me. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me because they are yours. Everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. And I am glorified in them. I love this. Jesus is talking, he's modeling for us. He's basically, as he's praying to God, he's telling his disciples, and he's telling us in the word, he's saying, God gave me something, his word, his way, his character, his nature, his will. And Jesus is saying, I gave this to them, and they kept my word. They kept the word. And I, I, I don't know about you all, but you ever hear a, a good word? A good sermon, a good message, uh, you read a good article, you read a good book, you, you spend time in the Bible, and it's, it's, it's something strong, something that sticks. You hear something on the radio, wherever, whatever meeting you hear from, it's something that's good, and you're tempted with the thought, I know I have, but you're tempted with the thought of this, ooh, that's a good word for my neighbor. Ooh, that's a good word for my spouse. Ooh, that's a strong word for my kid. I need, I need to send that to my child. I need to share this with, with somebody else. And although all that may be true, that the good word that you're hearing is good for anyone, it's first good for you. See, the word keeps you from evil when you keep the word. There'll be time for you to share that word with someone else, but you need to keep it first so that it can transform you and change you. What have you done with the words given to you? Have you held on to it long enough to let it permeate your heart, your mind? That will cause a level of transformation that's not just inward, but that it's also seen outward with your actions and with what you do. I know sometimes you hear a good word and you want to keep it, but it's hard to hold on to it because your device is full. Your iCloud storage is full you can't download that app. You can't take another picture. You can't take another video. You can't do another thing on your phone because it's full. And God, I believe, is wanting to give us good things. He wants to give us his word. He wants to impart truth and life into us. But sometimes we can't keep it 
to keep us from evil because we have no space in us to hold on to the thing that God's trying to give us. We're holding on and keeping things that we shouldn't have. We're keeping things that we shouldn't keep. But you need to clear something out to make space and make room for God to deposit his word inside of you. There are thoughts that are not from God that are living rent-free in your mind. They're in your soul. There are lies. There are curses. There are, are bad experiences. There are evil thoughts that have taken residence inside of you. That it's been there so long, you thought it was always there. You think that that's just how the world is. That's just what happens to me. That's just how I think. That's just my truth. But the reality is, is that at some point, something entered into your mind or an experience happened to you that you kept that there, that when God's truth comes, there's no room for you to receive and keep that because you're holding on to something else that's not good. There's this uh, ministry called RTF, Restoring the Foundations. And they define, they have these two words that they use, which are very good. It's ungodly beliefs and godly beliefs. They define ungodly beliefs like this. All beliefs, decisions, attitudes, agreements, judgments, expectations, vows, and oaths that do not agree with God. It disagrees with his word. It disagrees with his nature. It disagrees with his character. And on the other side, there's godly beliefs. Which, they, which are all the same things except they agree with God's word. They agree with God's nature and they agree with God's character. And so we have these ungodly beliefs and we have these godly beliefs. And if you can recognize which ones are which, then you know that you can get help from God to address them. And some of us, I say us because we all have them, but some of us have ungodly beliefs that we don't even know are ungodly. We think that's just the reality of the way things are and the way they should be. But they're impacting everything. It impacts the way you think. It impacts the way you hear. There, there are times you ever have a conversation or an argument with somebody, and you think it's an argument, and you think they're coming for you, and they're like, I'm not even trying to fight with you right now. But because of some ungodly beliefs that form and shape how people view you or how you view yourself, you respond out of those ungodly beliefs. Let me give you an example. And by the way, some of these have happened before you can even have memories about it. But God can help you search those things and reveal them to you. Uh, I want to take you back to my first grade year. Uh, I'm in school, and I was in class. And there was a certain time of day where uh, I was excused to go to a different class for math. Um, but, and all the other students stayed in the room. And, and one day, the teacher says, hey, Rich, uh, Richard, Rich, I don't even know what the teacher called me, but she said, it's time for you to go to math class, so go ahead and pull out your stuff. So I pulled out my stuff from under the desk, and then I stood up, and I started to walk out. But then she said, oh, wait a minute, we're going to do a quick spelling test, so why don't you have a seat uh, and do the test first, and then go to math class. I said, sure. So I put the little bag of pencils and, and things, and the spelling test was five words, five words of different colors. So the spelling, you know, red, blue, yellow, green. I don't remember all of them, but I remember the last one was orange, the word orange. So I took the test, um, and man, I, I aced the test. I got them all right, and I did it pretty quickly. I felt confident. I raised my hand. I said, hey, I finished my, my test. Can I go? She walks over to my desk, and she's like, Rich, what are you doing? I was like, um, what you asked me to do? She's like, you, you cheated. I said, what do you mean I cheated? I don't, I'm, I'm in first grade, y'all. I, I don't know any first grade that's intentionally trying to cheat. I could care less if I failed this test. This is, there's no influence of my life in first grade. I'm not thinking about school. I'm just trying to do what the teachers asked me to do. But she said, you're, and, and I know the word is pronounced crayons. My wife gets on me all the time. I say crowns. So type in the chat room. Do you say crayons or crayons? I say them both now. But I had, in, in my little bag of pens and pencils, I had some crayons. <laughs> and the, the, the orange crown was in there. 
And it's transparent, so you can see it. So because she saw that, she assumed that I used the crayon to get the word right on the paper. And I said, but I didn't do that. I really didn't. She's like, okay. She erased the word orange and said, spell orange again. Now, in my six or seven-year-old mind, I'm emotional at the time. I feel like, what is going on? I, don't even, I couldn't even describe the feelings that I had. But I remember this. I could close my eyes. I could still see the word orange that I originally wrote. Because you know when you erase something, you can still kind of see what you wrote before? But I was so flustered in that moment, I wrote down orange and I spelled it wrong. And in that moment, she was convinced that I was cheating and lying. And I was devastated. I got up, I ran, my mother worked at the school, and I ran to her uh, where she was, and I just remember crying. And I was consoled, and life went on, right? Time heals all wounds, right? Fast, flash forward 20 some odd years later, 20, almost 30 years later, God would begin to reveal to me that that moment marked me in a way that I had no clue how that changed the way I viewed the world. Why? Because in that experience, an ungodly belief was formed. And the ungodly belief was this. If I get in trouble even when I've done nothing wrong, then it doesn't matter if I do right or wrong. Therefore, I don't matter. I couldn't have put that into words at that age, but, but looking at that thread throughout my life, I recognize I think like that. I act like that. I've done a lot of things in my life I'm not proud of because I didn't think it mattered either way. I didn't think I mattered. Even after following Jesus and giving my life to him and walking with him for 15 plus years, 20 years, I'm still, I would still struggle with, but do I really matter? But this ungodly belief was revealed, but I'm so grateful that it's not just enough to know the lies, but it's to have the word that keeps us from evil. And the word that God gave me to combat that ungodly belief was this. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, it says, Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's consent, care, and concern. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. That is the word of God. Now, based off of the word of God, I was able to catch on and grab on to a godly belief that is rooted in God's word. By the way, you can't get a godly belief unless you search the word to get it. It's in his word. And here's the godly belief. What I do, seen or unseen, matters to God because I matter to God. Could you, I can't even imagine what my life would be like at the age of 18, 19, 14, 13 if, if I walked with the belief that what I do matters whether it's seen or unseen, oh my gosh. I have allowed that evil thought, that ungodly belief to take residence inside me for so long. Some of you all are going back in your mind like, dang, what were some of my experiences? Something more tragic, something different, I'm sure. But ask God to help bring out what are some things that you've allowed as truth that's not true at all. And then ask him to replace it. The word keeps us from evil when you keep the word. The second one here is the word keeps us from evil by fulfilling us. The word fulfills us, and in that fulfilling, we're kept from evil. In John chapter 17, we'll pick up in verse 11, he says this, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name that you have given me, so that they may be as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them and not one of them is lost, except the son of destruction so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you. I speak these things in the world so that they may be, so that they may have my joy completed in them. 
See, when Jesus walked in the flesh with the disciples that we read in the Gospels and we read in the Bible here, the living word walked with them, spoke to them, taught them, fed them, prayed with them, protected them. His presence filled them with everything they needed because he was there. But here in this prayer, he acknowledges that he's leaving two things. One, he's leaving the disciples, physically at least. And two, which is great, is he's leaving them his word. He didn't leave them with nothing. He left them with his word. Why? So that they would have something to hold on to in faith no matter how hard it got. When they felt like they couldn't see Jesus, when they couldn't stand next to him, when they couldn't break bread with him, when they couldn't do anything physical, sleep in the same, you know, campground with him, they had his word, which is a great, not a substitute, it is God. It, it, his word is him. It's who he was. And we now find ourselves, in the, the disciples found themselves in the same position as us, which is we don't have Jesus physically here with us. But in the times that it's hard to see God, it's hard to hear God, it's hard to find God, guess what? We're not empty and we're not lacking. We could be complete because he's given us his word. The word keeps us from evil by fulfilling us. Completeness, completeness and fulfillment. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable <clears throat> for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God or woman of God, child of God, for us, so that we may be complete, equipped for every good work. The word completes us. For, and it allows us and trains us for every good work. It gives us what we need. You know, Jesus, before he started his public ministry, he fasted for 40 days. No food for 40 days. And at the end of this 40-day fast, he was tempted. He was tempted by the devil with three particular things. And I love this. At the end of the fast, he's more hungry than he's probably ever been. Maybe he's weak. Maybe he's tired. He has all the excuses that we would want to have when we fall into sin or fall into temptation. He was there at that moment, but he was never empty. Jesus was never empty, and he was full. The first temptation that came, the devil literally said to him, he said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus responds, he says, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, which is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, 3. So for those of you like me that skip over some of those Old Testament books in the Bible, this was Jesus' go-to in the middle of his temptation. He was full of the word. He stretched back to Deuteronomy and said, I'm going to pull this word out, and boom, it's going to keep me from evil right now. And the devil said, okay, came back after a couple of things. He tempted again and said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And his response came from Psalm 91, verse 11 and 12. He said, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And here's what I love. Jesus wasn't just going blow for blow. This wasn't even a contest. It wasn't like one temptation, one scripture. One temptation, one scripture. Jesus, without prompting, gives another scripture. He said, it's also written, do not test the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 16. It's almost as if Jesus hit him with a two-piece combo, y'all. He's like, look, you try to come for me. Not only am I dodging you, I'm not over here like, oh, God, God is love. Oh, he, he died for me. Oh, Jesus, what? He, he, is, he is full, even though he's hungry, even though he's been fasting. Physically, he might be deteriorated, but in his soul and his heart, he was full because the word fulfills us. And in the moment of temptation, you don't have to stretch and deep down into the emptiness to pull something out. There is overflow that even with one temptation, he gets boom, boom, two scriptures. And the devil comes back again and says, I'll give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me, looking at the kingdoms of the world. And then Jesus responds. He said, go away, Satan. And he could say that. He could tell Satan to go away and be kept from evil because of this. 
for it is written. He's going back to the word. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 13. I feel like I need to go read Deuteronomy again. Jesus is just pulling him back. But he's full. And that's what is allowing him to be kept from evil. And then the last one here. The word keeps us from evil by giving us a mission. I hope this is encouraging you, by the way. If you're online, if something hits you, put it in the chat. Put a scripture in the chat. Encourage one another. But the word keeps us from evil by giving us a mission. In John chapter 17, verse 14, it says this. I have given them your word. The world hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them so that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for for those who believe in me through their word. See, Jesus is already thinking generationally that those, that they're going to be people like us. We're from the world. We get pulled out of the world to be sent back into it. And Jesus is acknowledging that he's praying for those who will believe in him through the word that the disciples share, which is the very word that Jesus is giving them. The word keeps us from evil by giving us mission. And you would hope that as he's praying about what he's doing for the disciples, you would hope that he would do one or two things, that he would ask God to remove them from the world since the world's going to hate them and it's going to be hard, that either God either remove us from the world or protect us from the world, but he does neither. Jesus is fully aware of the hostility that the world has for those who accept and believe in his word. And he, and he doesn't choose to remove us from the world, rather to send us directly back into it. Why? Because he's doing to us what was done to him. He already did it. Jesus understood the assignment. So that's why he was able to fulfill what he was called to do, not be scared and run away from the cross, but to walk in the mission that God given him. You ever wondered why historically the church seems to grow in times of persecution, in times of global pandemic, in times of hardship, in turmoil, in, in suffering, in persecution, in attacks, the church always seems to grow. Why? Because the assignment for the church, the assignment for us is to shine in darkness. That's what we're called to do. So when that happens, the assignment helps us understand the job description, the mission description that the word gives us helps us know what's coming so we're not caught off guard. We're not afraid of bad things happening. We don't want them to happen, but the word is very clear that when you give your life to Jesus, you, oh, I'm always going to have money. I'm always going to have health. I'm always, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. My parents aren't going to get a divorce. I'm not going to get a divorce. No one, I'm, I'll always have job offers. And, and if you think that, that's an error. Now, you might get some of that or all of it, but his promise, his word clearly lays out, this is what's your inheritance. This is what the mission is. This is what the job is, and it's going to be hard. So when those things happen, we can take courage. Why? Because we're fulfilling the mission that God gave us. There's no bait and switch. You ever take a job that has a certain description, and then after you work in there, the boss asks you to do something different? <laughs> And some of y'all, like, you might respond, like, I'm not doing that. I'm not getting paid for that. Others might be like, okay, I'll do it. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I know this. The word sends us on mission. And it's very clear about what we're supposed to do. We shouldn't be surprised when we're persecuted, when we're attacked, when we're hated and rejected. It's all in the word. He tells us it's going to happen. And I love this. Jesus did and does everything everything he asked us to do. Fight temptation, he did it. Speak truth at work, he did it. Ask you to preach, he did it. Ask you to get up early and spend time with God in prayer and read, you know, he did that. 
Clean some dirty feet. He did it. Serve. He did it. Lay your life down for the sake of the gospel. He did it. He doesn't ask you to do anything that he hasn't already done. His prayer wasn't to protect us from the world, but from the evil one, meaning what? That we're protected from the evil one, meaning the evil one cannot stop us from fulfilling what God called us to fulfill. The world's going to be the world, but the evil one cannot stop what we're going to do in the world. You can't threaten a child to go to their room if they really, really want to go to their room. I may or may not have had this interaction with my daughter. I did. But one time I was like, if you don't clean up this mess tonight for dinner, you're only eating broccoli. I thought I had her. And she goes, that's cool. I like broccoli. It's healthy. She doesn't really like broccoli. But in that moment, she took away the threat and the fear of the punishment that I was trying to inflict on her. Why? Because she knew she was, she was willing to accept what it was. See, when you're willing to accept how the world is going to treat you, not may treat you, but will treat you, you can't be touched. You can't threaten someone who's not afraid to die with death. We're going to take all your money away. The Lord Jehovah Jireh is my provider. I'm going to take your health away. You can take my health away. You can take my mind away. You can take my body away. But once I die, I'm in heaven with God. So how, why, why am I losing sleep at night? I'm prepared for this. Do you understand the mission that God has sitting you on? But when we can live that way, that, the, that the, all the bad stuff of the world doesn't impact us the way it impacts everybody else, because we understand the mission and the assignment that God's given us, we set ourselves apart different from others, and the people of the world are astonished and amazed at that. How, how are they stoning? Isn't he one of Jesus' followers? He's being stoned, and yet he's saying, Lord, thank you, and I worship you. You can't take, the world can't take from us what the Lord has given us. But we can give it away. Because when the world sees a partial Christian, it gains another excuse for unbelief. But the word keeps us from evil by giving us a mission. Let's get on mission. Let's get back on mission. So I just want to close as I recap this. The word keeps us from evil when you keep the word. The word keeps us from evil by fulfilling us. And the word keeps us from evil by giving us a mission. Please, get in your word and let this word get in you. I hope you're encouraged. Love you.